It looked absolutely great, so no problems at all. That's brilliant. I'd Aye. never heard of the app before, so yeah, all good. Aye, but thank you for coming on, because I know everybody's busy and everyone's got life and bits and pieces and all that sort of thing. So Thanks for having us, Ian. We appreciate it. Aye. It's appreciated yeah. you coming on. So, um, is, is it just the three of you that are there, or is there others that I can't see? No, see? just the three of us. Right, so there is five of you in the band. I know, so you've got obviously John, you're on the guitar. We've got, Malcolm on, we've got Malcolm on drums. Yeah, yeah he's not here. We've got Paul on vocals. That's me. Yep, we've got Stevie on keys and we've got Graham on bass. That's me, Graham. Yep, that's fine. So we've got the three the three of the best ones out of the five. <laughs> <laughs> Most important ones. The ones that matter. <laughs> but what I'll do is we're just going to talk about music in general and um, I'll put the questions out there and I'll just get an answer from each of you because it'll be okay. interesting to get a different answer from each person. So first of all, where where are you? Where are you from? Where did you grow up? We're based in Glasgow. Right, is that um, all you the, all just Yeah, the, the five of us are more or less round about Glasgow. But some of us are on the outskirts of Glasgow now, but I think most of us are all pretty much born and bred here. Yeah. Right, okay. And um, see, growing up, so see when you were, were really young, um, were you into music when you were really young, like, like as a small child? Um, probably in some way, but yeah, um, I mean... I guess for me, it's that sort of standard thing where you're into your, whatever your parents' record collection are at the time, do you know what I mean? And I remember, remember listening to a lot of stuff then. It was probably when I was maybe about 14 before I started looking at music a bit more seriously in terms of, you know, what albums you really wanted yourself. And that, stuff that was like the that. same for me about that age as well. Um, my mum and dad were always playing like ABBA in, in the house and stuff. Uh, my dad had a, a great record collection and it wasn't until about 16 uh, when I kind of joined a band with uh, a few of my mates for, uh, for school and uh, I started off on the keyboards and then um, transformed, uh, transferred over to bass uh, after that, so uh, yeah. What about yourself? Um, I think I was a wee bit earlier as far as when I started to get a real interest in music. Oh, I, there's kind of two things that always jump out to me and one of them was in my dad's car we were going over to my grand's house and our friend's electric came on, the Tube Army track. And I don't know what it was about it, it just I just thought it was mind blowing. It just sounded so amazing to me. And I remember getting that as a single and then messaging a bottle by the police was the, the other thing that really, I think that was the kind of time, I must have been about, I don't know, nine maybe at that point. And I remember thinking, I'd love to do that. And ever since then, I was into music and, um, you know, just kind of followed it on from then. But probably some of the ages to the, to the guys there before I actually started doing anything with it. I was probably about 15, you know, so. Mm -hmm. so. So here's a fun question for each of you. Do, do you remember what the first single or album was that you bought with your own money? Uh, yeah. you go on uh, With my own money, it yes. was uh, Credo by Fish. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think mine's was Human League. Right. Um that I remember. I can't remember anything before that. Yeah. Message in a bottle. That was the first that was the first single that I bought with pocket money. Um yeah, I remember I remember getting it, I remember what it looked like. It was A and M records and that. I remember everything about it. Yeah. And so so you are all stuck when you're probably becoming teenagers you're starting to kind of discover your own music the style that you like I'm assuming that's probably what got each of you into wanting to maybe learn an instrument start to play bands but how did each of you get into um, playing an instrument like what was your first instrument how did you get into it for me it was bass um, I started on bass uh, because I knew some guys who, I knew a guy who was a guitarist and a guy who was who just got a drum kit for his birthday uh, and somebody else that we knew played piano at school. So the only thing that wasn't, the, you know, the only constituent of a band that there wasn't was a bass player. So I thought, well, I'll do that. Because, you know, like naively think that you've got to start a band with these three guys that you know. Um, and that was kind of where I started. So, um, but, but it was really, it was always about, I wanted to write songs. I was I was interested in writing the songs. So I started in bass and then moved to acoustic guitar just to write songs. Yeah. Yep. I mean, for me, um, I was working with some guys 
it was a sort of after school thing. Um, I used to work in a job there and they had started a band and it was all kind of Led Zeppelin covers and stuff like that they were doing. Uh, and they asked me if I wanted to have a go at singing. Um, so we ended up recording in my five foot by five foot bedroom with a hi-fi with two tape decks on it. Right, okay. With drums and everything in it. And that's how I get kind of persuaded into sort of like getting into a band in the first place. And then from there, it just kind of kicked off, you know? Mm. Yep. Uh, for me, as I said earlier on, I started off in keys and then transport, uh, transferred over the bass. But um, the re- one of the reasons that I stuck with the bass and really get into it was uh, was I found Rush uh, and really got into Geddy Lee. And you know, I was I, I really tuned into um, his playing, and um, I just got the headphones on and started you know jamming away at Geddy Lee uh, all the time. So Geddy Lee actually. Uh, taught me how to play bass. Yeah. Um, so I, I love how he says, I just put the headphones on and I started jamming to get you lead. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I, I, that's that's how I'm. <laughs> so, so here's a question. This is this is one for yourself, Paul, right? Yes. Everybody else, like, like I started off playing guitar, right? Mm. Now, I got some lessons mm. just to kind of show me the basics and then it's enough to just kind of set you on the right path and you start to learn from other people, and you pick things up by yourself. Yeah. So, singing is a very is very different. So you, you can learn an instrument having never been taught, but but singing is a whole other ball game because a lot of singing is confidence. Yes, there yeah. has to, there certainly does have to be. You have to have some talent. You have to be able to hold a tune. You'd be able to you have to be able to listen, mm-hmm. but. How did you get into singing then if you'd never done it before or was it just pure confidence and I want to give that a shot? I mean, I guess from a po- some point of view you realise that you can sing but um, it's just waiting for that opportunity. I, I always loved music from a young age. Never really, You never really kind of think that's something that you can get into when you're sort of 13, 14. I was into football and stuff like that when I was younger so that was the path that I was looking at so I wasn't really thinking about music even though I loved it. Um, and it was only when I kind of hit that sort of 16 years old that I started to hang about with more people that uh, knew uh, played instruments. Um, so and and I got onto a kind of scene where where a lot of people were all in bands, but they were all friends and they were all helping each other out in different bands. So that's when I first to get exposed to that. And uh, yeah, I think from a young age I had the confidence to to, to just try it, you know and. Uh, he was unbelievably cocky, right? So you so that you know that he was unbelievably cocky when he was young, right? So <laughs> and you had the hair and, and, yeah. and, and a big mane of hair. So he was Let, um, he was a great frontman for really early on. Let's be honest: if you're going to be a frontman and singing, you do have to be a bit like that, though. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Of you, so you're you're obviously on vocals. Other guys, you've all got your instruments. Who was your your influences growing up with regard to the instrument that you're actually playing? Uh, for me, I would say... So I, I don't have the big kind of romantic guitar story that a lot of guitarists have. You know, they'll tell you that they, they saw Clapton playing his Red Strat and they instantly fell in love. It wasn't really like that. I started playing guitar because it was like a thing that I needed to do to write songs. So I never really sat out to be a guitarist. Um, and I'm sure the guys in the band would say that I've never quite reached to be a guitarist at any point. But um, so the guitar was always the song was first for me, and then the guitar was a thing that moved the song along in the same way as the bass was and the drum was. I never really so, but I would say that one of the guitar things I really remember was uh, I was into David Bowie, and I really loved. It was the time that he brought Let's Dance. So it was '83, so I'm probably about twelve and. I remember thinking that the guitar on those tracks was terrific. I, I didn't, I had no idea who it was. And then a few years later, I found out it was Stevie Ray Vaughan, and then I started listening to him. So I was really influenced by Stevie Ray Vaughan uh, as far as listening to that type of. It was the first time I really listened to any kind of blues guitar, um, yeah. and I always preferred that style of playing. I, I was never particularly into the kind of real technique guys as much as I admire everything that they do. And um, guys like Eddie Van Halen was just like unbelievable guitarists, but I always kind of gravitated towards Dave Gilmer and then a bunch of the blues guys like Stevie Ray Vaughan, so um, 
I would say that, but I, I certainly don't have the kind of big romantic story about one guitarist that blew my mind, you know. Don't <laughs> care. Care. And what about the bass for yourself? Um, so for me, I mentioned it earlier on about uh, Geddy Lee, so um, for me it was the technique because I was just kind of blown away with what could be done by the instrument, so uh, so Geddy uh, was one of my main influences and then I kind of uh, switched on to Billy Sheehan and like Marcus Miller, so you know, prog rock was maybe kind of the first uh, genre of music kind of that I got into and then, you know, went into kind of the jazz route for a wee while and you know, started listening to Jacob Pistorius and, uh, you know, Weather Report and things like that. But I've always been interested in what can be done on the instrument, whether it is the slap and pop or whether it's the fretless or, you know, wh whatever. It's, um, yeah, it's always, the, 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 I've always gravitated to the bass. So, so you, you might embarrass yourselves here, but uh, let, tell me about each of your first bands. I <laughs> How did you get them together, your first gigs, things like that? Because everybody, it's usually a disaster when you think back. Uh, you need to do these things in order to improve and progress. Yeah. Getting better. Yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I, I think for me, the, the first couple of gigs that I played were actually in people's houses. Um, where you, you just have loads of friends and parties and stuff like that. And most people just turn up with acoustics or... I mean, I, the first band I was in was called Crime and Passion, which was just me and a bass player. Um, and it kind of sounded a bit like Duran Duran. Well, I thought it did, but whether it actually did, I don't know. But um, yeah, but I mean, like me and John, have, we've all known each other for a long time. Yeah. Um, I mean, I hooked up with John when we were, what, probably about 19 or something like that. Yeah, something so, like that. Yeah. So that's when we we done like thousands of gigs, early days. Same with Graham. Graham was on the scene in another band. We were there was a good Glasgow scene at the time, yeah. um, and we were in kind of rival bands. <laughs> um, good camaraderie, and we we always used to headline together. Um, yeah, we played loads of gigs together. Yeah, so we I, did, I, right? I was the bass player in our band, and then Graham was the bass player in the other band. So him and I had an actual rivalry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> although I never really admit it, but he was actually much better than me. But yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. No. So we I used to play. We space. used to do like double headliners and King Tuts and stuff like that in Glasgow, um, and and that's kind of where we cut our teeth. Um, really, I mean, we we played every single weekend, uh, sometimes twice a week, for a good few years. Yeah. Um, and that really stood us in good stead and um, for sort of like crafting yourself for yeah. for for um, yeah. the future. You know. Yeah. I mean, it is amazing when you think about the amount of. If you're in a, a band or playing the pubs or that, the amount of gigs that you play, and you maybe don't think it at the time because you're just turning up, you're playing, you know, you might not think it's any different from something else, but see when you've done that long enough, you don't realise how much you learn from doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it just, it gives you that kind of confidence, like yeah. when you're playing live, um, you know, when you've done so many gigs, you, you have a bit more calmness about being yeah. on stage because you kind of you kind of know what you're good, doing to a certain extent. I mean, the good thing about us, we go and play live and we can set up pretty quickly because we know exactly what we're doing, what kind of sound we've got. And that kind of stands you in good stead for when you're doing festivals and stuff. Um, That's not the thing as well. You, you, you know, having played enough gigs, this is, this is our sound, this is what we are aiming for. To sound like when we are playing, you know yes. probably how to interact with an audience. You're, you're yeah. okay. You might still be a bit nervous, but mm -hmm. it's good. To, like you're actually on stage. You, you know that once you're out there, you are capable of doing what is required of you in the yeah. band. Yeah. yeah, and and you only get that from playing millions of gigs and mm -hmm. a lot of really bad gigs as well. Well, that's it. You know, small and large gigs, no matter what, um, you know, it's all adds to the experience. Oh, yeah. So, obviously, it all kind of started out, it sounds quite similar, uh, starting out learning your instruments, uh, starting bands. So, fast forward all these years up to the pandemic, the whole entire world shuts down and all of a sudden um, you died over... Now, if I remember correctly, it was a whiskey, drunken-fueled uh, Zoom call. 
that just decided let's start a band. <laughs> it, it definitely was. Um, you know, like I say, we've all known each other a long time um, and still been good friends and worked with each other on different projects through the years, so we've kept in contact. And uh, I think through the pandemic, like a lot of people were, if you're a musician, it, the best thing about it is it gave you time to sort of like write songs if, if, if you were that way inclined. So we, we'd written loads of ideas and stuff and just were waiting for the moment to to sort of like start something. Now, at that point, it wasn't even we were going to start a band. But we, we, we had a Zoom call, we all had a few drinks um, and we decided to start a band. And uh, you still, decided to well, start. I decided <laughs> you to start a band. <laughs> um, and then woke up the next day and still seemed like a good idea. So yeah, um, yeah. that's how it sort of came together. So and get a wee laugh because I've joked with a few people about this. Normally I would, I would ask how did you come up with the band name because see the amount of bands I've either been in or that I've known that they've split up before they've even played the first song because they cannot agree on a band name. Mm -hmm. The band name. That was, that was a pretty easy sort of like um I have this thing where, where bands that I've been in before I always seem to have an animal in the name. Oh, um, right. and, and it just seemed natural to me to have another animal. And the word bison for me, sort of like, in the blues sort of genre, seems to sort of like cross over from the American market to the British market and stuff. And that was my thinking behind it. Um, and then, well, the, the word hip was... That was a joke that somebody made about... Uh, at our age, everybody would need an extra replacement hip at some point. So, what part of the bison would be getting replaced first? Well, it would be the hip. So, and then, I, I don't think any of the rest of us put any thought in it at all. We just kind of liked the sound of it once we had that conversation. So, um, so that was it. Really, it was uh, that was kind of quick, wasn't it? Yeah, it wasn't yeah. really much discussion. Really, yeah. It's sometimes that thing as well. If nobody can come up with anything better, then we'll just go with that. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it is that. I sometimes yeah. it is. Uh, yeah. You, so, you can be going down the houses with a band name if you let it go too far. <laughs> yeah. So, as a band, how do you go about songwriting? And what I mean by that is, do if you are, you know, you're writing an album, do you use the five of you go away? Do you come up with ideas and do you come in with a sort of half a song already complete that you can work on, or do you simply turn up to your practice with nothing arranged? and you start jamming to see what happens, or is it maybe a wee bit of both? There's pretty much an idea of a song kicking around, um, and we'll normally do sort of rough demos of it, um, and then pass that round everybody before we go to the studio, so we don't ever turn up with nothing at all. Um, it wouldn't be possible for us to do that, just because we've all got these <coughs> other lives going on, with work and family and all that stuff that's going to go, so we've got massively limited amount of time in to do stuff, so what we'll do is we'll put it together, everybody will go away and learn what they're going to do for it and then take it in the studio and see what works and generally speaking it will come together unbelievably quickly because the idea's there as a starting point. So, And yeah. see when, do, do you like recording? Because I know some people, they simply record because you have to record to put something out in order to, to gig, gigging's their thing. I personally, I like going in and recording, I like creating something from nothing. Do you like recording, or is it pretty much just that we need to do it in order to get out there? I, th I think we all enjoy recording, because we've been doing it a long time. Um, I think the only, the, the, there's like two sides to the, the, the sword here. It's like, when we go in and record, because we're not a signed band as such, we don't have the luxury of going into the studio and spending a month to record everything, like John was saying there. Um, so we have to do it quicker. So for me, I would rather I, we could spend a lot more time in the studio because I enjoy it that much. Yep. But the other advantage is we go into the studio and we put a lot of restrictions on ourselves because of the time frame. So like, for example, we might only do three takes of a song. We might we only use the instruments that we've got. We try not to overdub as many things. We try not to add additional instruments that we can't actually play live. So those restrictions kind of, I think they benefit us um, and Maybe creates creates our sound. Too, too much time and money is not always a good thing because no. you could, no. if you're a perfectionist, you could spend forever to the point that the song never got finished. Yes, yes. 
definitely. But I, I think I may be know the answer to this just from what you were saying there, but I was going to ask, how do you record as a band? So do you record live and then do maybe a couple of overdubs at the end? Mm -hmm. or, is that pretty yeah, much it? That, that's pretty much it, yeah. I mean, like John has said, we, we try and rehearse. Once we've kind of like got the, the tracks kind of formed between us all, we go in, maybe rehearse a couple of, uh, rehearse the tracks, and then when we get to record, it makes it a quicker process. Um, and we try, like I say, a lot of the time, first takes the best. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that we we restricted ourselves to three takes because I think once we get to the fourth, the excitement that was in the first two or three is kind of gone, um, and everybody started to think about what they're doing. But uh, yeah, there's no, we don't use click tracks, we don't auto tune vocals, we don't, you know, there's pretty much it's, you know, there's no, there's nothing like that. We just try and do so everything that you hear on it, particularly drums and bass, is exactly as you hear it, but there was that done in that day in the studio, there's no editing or anything, so we don't get involved in any of that, because it I mean, makes the process too long. That is good, I've listened to your stuff, and it sounds really good, especially even more so if it's if it's pretty much live for the majority yeah. of it. Yeah. But also, I mean, I think that stands us in good stead, because when you come to see us live, it's exactly what you thought it was going to be, or yeah, what you yeah. hoped it was going to be. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, the live performance is even better because you're getting that dynamics in it and stuff. Um, yeah, because so. it, it is, now I've, I've spoke to, I've done, a pot, I, I done an episode a couple of episodes ago and there was someone from a band on and the way they record is completely different. Not too different from a lot of bands, but they, they layer it up so they'll record the drums first, then the bass and then the guitars and, and you know, they kind of build it up. But what they were saying was that they'll write something and then it's that thing, you've got the luxury of like your Pro Tools and things like that, that, of course. that you can, um, sometimes when they go to play it live, it's the first time they've ever played the song from start to finish, because <laughs> they've yeah, recorded yeah. it bits or they've, you know, they've recorded the first verse and then they just go right, copy and paste. Mm -hmm. Personally, I don't like that, that method because I feel like it loses something. Yeah. It's good for some people, it's brilliant, but they go for it. Me personally, I, I, I don't like doing it that way because I feel like something gets missed. Yeah, but absolutely. Yeah. That's there, there, there is a, for, for me anyway, there's a, there, there's a chemistry uh, between a bassist and a drummer that you just, you, you, you've either got it or you haven't. And Malky and I have been playing together for so many years. I know his style inside out, he knows mine as well. So yeah. when we get a new track, and we're, we're in the studios and we're rehearsing and you try we'll work out little bits, little flourishes, little runs, you know, and they're locked in at rehearsal so that when it comes to, you know, putting the track down as live bass and drums, we know exactly what we're doing, you know, and we follow each other. I watch, you know, exactly what he's doing, he listens to me, so we're all we're tuned in and that's what goes down. Yeah. It's all. It's almost like doing it the other way. It sounds silly, but it's almost like you can be too perfect, that it, it takes mm -hmm. a bit. And, yeah. uh, and if you think of the bands, see the bands from years and years ago, so you had bands like The Doors, The Who, The Rolling Stones, The Beatles, I mean, a lot of these bands, they went in and uh, most of it was recorded pretty quickly, it was, it was mm -hmm. quite yeah. quickly, and, and you could probably argue that technology nowadays, you would maybe get, get it sounding better, but would it make, it, make the song better? Possibly mm -hmm. not, because... Mm -hmm. You know, they would maybe spend too much time doing it, or you know, there is some something that's technology has progressed, and it's really, really good, but in some mm. way also really bad. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah. there's certain there's certain genres of music that are suited to doing the old Pro Tools thing and the copy and paste, and the, you know, like your R and B and all that. Some of that stuff kind of sounds great when you hear it all put together, but from a sort of blues rock that type of uh, music yeah. it, as live as you can get it to sound is, is the best and closest um, and you don't do yourself an injustice by you know let, like you say layering everything up and then it sounds amazing in the album and then you go and play live and you're like you need another 20 people to make it sound the same you know yeah, yeah. Here's, a, here's a question as well I don't know if, if this is just for Paul or maybe the others as well but is it just yourself that writes the lyrics for the songs, or does everybody contribute? No, well, 
predominantly John and and myself. I, I have John's probably predominantly the, the the strongest songwriter in the band, um, and then I come come up with some ideas and stuff. But we we all have different ways of of adding things in. So John, uh, John, if you let's say you're the main songwriter though, are you writing instrumentals or are you also writing lyrics? Yeah, lyrics and yeah, right, right, generally speaking, it's more of a collaboration between John I, and Colin. I, I would I would say that the most important thing for our band is the story within the song. So it's not always appropriate for two people to write that because that person's got the vision of what that song was about. Yeah. So, but me and John do collaborate with lyrics and maybe like half I've written, half he's written. The good yeah. thing about Myself and John, because we've known each other such a long time, when John writes lyrics, I feel as if I've wrote them <laughs> because I can actually pinpoint exactly where I am in that song. And I think that's one of the strongest parts of our band is the fact that, yeah, a lot of people come up and go, oh, what was that song about? You wrote that. And I'll go, well, actually, John wrote it. But because I'm singing it yeah. with the, the same passion that he wrote it, people can't tell. Do you know what, what I mean? So... So yeah, I wrote every single song in every lyric. <laughs> so what about what about um, artwork, right? So <laughs> so to me, growing up, right, I, I'm a bit a wee bit younger than yourselves. However, when I grew up, when I was growing up, it was long before the internet and all that sort of stuff. So you would go to a music, your, your friend would maybe introduce you to a band. Now you'd go into the music shop and you'd, you'd look them up in the section that they're at. You you would buy an album simply based on the yeah. art of the album. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I would buy I would buy an album, and you'd look at the artwork in the front, and you'd be the artwork in the back, the artwork in the middle. You'd take mm. out like the booklet or whatever it was, and you would you know all that was important. The the track list, you know, this mm -hmm. song that starts the album that leads into the next song. We've got yeah. This song, all that was important, and I I feel like that's a shame that that completely been lost nowadays. Yeah, that's because, tragic. because yeah. of streaming, down, yeah. you know, you don't play albums now. You play a song, and mm, yes. a lot of younger people will be like, "Why would you even need artwork?" But you know, there'll be a, a certain age onwards that that t is just as important. So, is, is all the artwork and that still important to you guys? Mm. Very much so. Um, I mean, because it, you st even if you're browsing through Apple Music or Spotify, you still look at the cover of, yes. of something. You still tie it in with what's there. Um, especially if you're looking blind and you don't know what kind of music you're looking for and you're just looking for something that takes your fancy. So there's an element of that that is... We, we tend to try and make our artwork stand out as much as possible. When you when you're on Apple Music and you've got twenty album covers there, oh, that's the one I want to listen to. Yeah, um, and, and that's hard hard to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I get what you're saying, you know, the whole thing about opening a vinyl, opening a CD, and looking at the booklet and reading the lyrics, and then any the biggest thing is is like who produced the album, who was involved in it. You tend to don't. No one knows these things, so they just go, "Oh, there's a band." In most cases, they don't even know the names of the artists. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. apart from maybe the singer because they're interested in the voice from the song. But you know, a lot of the times, if you if you speak to people and they go, "Who was it that played the drums on that album?" They have no clue. I think years ago we all knew that, didn't we? Because Aye. by the time you got home, you were on the bus after buying it. And mm. you'd, you'd read all the gateful sleeve as you were saying there about the booklet, you know. And I think you're right about the order of the album. That's massively important to me. That yeah. I spent a lot of time thinking about that because I think that listening to tracks, I don't like best of albums. I never have liked best no, of I mean, albums. Yeah. I like to hear the snapshot of the artist in that time of when he went from the first track to the last track. Of you know, there's, there's a story to an album, mm. or there, there should be, and if it's a good one, mm. there's a story. It's a strange one because. Years ago, you would probably buy an album and you would know it inside out simply because you weren't spoiled for choice. You, if you had 15 albums sitting there, that's the 15 albums that you were listening to. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays, 
it, it's unlimited, but it's almost like there's so, there's too much that it could just get lost amongst everything. Mm. Else. So, yeah. as you're saying, if you've got twenty albums on on the iTunes that you want the album cover to stand out, to make yeah. you from the others that are there. Yeah, I think that choice thing's difficult. It's a bit. I guess you could say it's similar to current television, isn't it? Because you know, when I was young, there was three, maybe four channels, and you had to get up off your backside and go and press the little button on the TV to change it. But you always managed to find something to watch. But now, I can never find anything to watch, but there's like a million yeah. channels, you know what? Oh. Like, I sit and scroll for like two hours. So, uh, too much choice, I don't think it's a good thing. Who comes up with your artwork, the ideas? Is yeah, that yeah. something that you're just passionate about? You, you just like doing that side of it as well? Well, my job is graphic designer, so it kind of does par for the course. Hand in hand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh. yeah. So, but we all, we all have a say in, in what that's going to be, you know. Uh, oh. Everybody's got their own opinions about these things. So, oh, I mean, honestly, I, I could kill everybody in the band when it comes to doing that because I'm like, this is the one. Two weeks later, no, that's not the one, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but, yeah. But you're, you're playing in a band. And as we know, the, the main thing about being in a band is you get songs together and you get out there and you gig. It's a silly question. I assume you all love gigging. I mean, that'll be the most fun part of the entire process. Uh, is there anything you don't like about gigging? The the waiting about. I, don't like that. I hate the waiting about. You know, if you if you go and do a gig and you're playing an hour and a half, and a bit of, but either side of that, it could take you three hours. You know, uh, that's the only bit that I don't really like. I, I hate the anticipation. I would rather just step out the, out the van and just go straight on the stage. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think what happens is you, you're excited about the gig, but you're also nervous and you're also a bit jumpy. And that period before it, if it's too long, mm. yeah, you, you know, you're like a caged tiger yeah. sometimes, you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I was going to say, it's that thing I was going to ask. He's getting nervous, and I don't mean there's different kind of nerves. So there's the I don't mean the you're thrown up because you're, you're that nervous. But mm -hmm. what, I mean, I, I play gigs, and I'm usually there is a nerve there, but it, it's not. I, I know that the minute I get out there and start playing, mm -hmm. I know that I'm capable of doing the gig. Yeah, I yes. think it's the nerves of getting out there and actually playing is that yeah. kind of for, for each of yourselves. Yeah, my nerves are always related to less about me and less about the kind of audience part of it more about I don't want to let the guys down. Yeah. I'll say that's what I feel about it. It's like I, I don't want to be, I, I don't want to let anybody down in the band. It's like, because we are kind of close, the five of us together and when we play a gig it's quite a, it's quite a big deal for us um, because we've known each other for so long. So I always feel that's where my nerves come from is I don't want to let the band down rather than, you know, I, Will we make mistakes? Absolutely, of course, every time. But um, I think that's when I get a bit nervous about it because I'm kind of thinking, do I let the guys do more than about it going wrong for the audience? Yeah. Or whatever. It's, 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 it's funny that because, like, you think about that. We all think about that, right? Because every gig feels important, and you want it to go well. And you're always thinking. For me, I always worry that something's going to go wrong, right? And and you worry about that. But see, when it actually goes wrong. You just deal with it without yeah, even yeah. thinking about it. You know, the, the microphone stops working <laughs> before you know the guy's got to go and change the sound and change the mic. And and yeah. and, you, and it's amazing how you, in that moment you go, what am I going to do? And then John just comes up to me and goes, just go and talk. And then you go, okay. And you just do it. And yeah. you forget. You know, well, there's no what, nerves there. You know, it just happens. That's kind of what you were saying earlier, Ian, isn't it? That the, all the years of experience of doing gigs where absolutely everything that could have went wrong has already happened and all, over all those years there and yeah. nothing's that big a deal now because you kind of know that you'll be all right you know yeah i mean I, I i have a friend who was playing and it's just exactly what you're saying there the fact that they had years of experience they were able mm -hmm. to deal with anything that came up and they done a song where it got to the middle of the song it just finished the guitar solo the drummer had it went into a nice sort of quiet section before it went into the last chorus and just as the drummer came out it came out the guitar solo, he'd done his drum fill, hit the cymbal and it was one of those ones where the cymbal fell over and it sliced right through the guitarist's cables so everything on his guitar thing just cut out 
Yeah, now he's fun. I mean, <laughs> what do we do now? But yeah. you've still got the drummer and the bass player who just decided, Let, let's just have a wee jam here. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> Singer started to improvise until someone managed to run on with new guitar cables and hook it up. Yeah. Yeah. If you're a younger band or with less experience, yeah. that would throw you. you. You maybe wouldn't be able to deal with that. Yeah. You, you just figure it out as you go along. I, I think probably myself, I, I've been gigging for like 20 plus years and it, it, I get more nervous about not, I know that I'll perform, and it, it's things going wrong, <coughs> technical issues. Yeah, yeah, I'm the same. Yeah. Yeah. With your control to a yeah, degree. Yeah. And the thing is, you kind of forget that you put so much importance on a gig, no matter how big, no matter how small, but you forget the people on the other side of the stage are just people, they're just human. If something happens, they're, they're very forgiving. You know, they're just like, okay, so we'll wait 10 minutes till you fix it. <coughs> in your head, you're thinking, oh my God, oh my God. It's bigger than what it actually is, you know. Nah, nah. So I've had a wee look at your uh, releases. That you mm-hmm. think you've so I've got a wee note here, so I've got your, um, this time, Single came out 18th of February 2022. Mm-hmm. You yep. had your, um, let's see, your Dear Green and Blues EP, 4th of March, that was 2022. Mm-hmm. Interesting name for being in Glasgow. <laughs> 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 you've got your Midlife Crisis EP, 29th of July 2022. And then you've got your older Strange Better album, which was 8th of April last year. Last year, yeah. yeah. So for the Let's have a wee let's look here for the midlife crisis EP. Mercy, right? Yeah. Mercy, right? <laughs> okay. The mid now is it midlife crisis EP. Yes. The Grafter. Yeah. Yes. Love the guitar work. Now I'm a guitarist, so I automatically get going to that. But yeah. what a great sound! Were these all recorded on in separate sessions, or was this just one session and then you've released them bit by bit? The, the two EPs were one session. And then right. the album was a separate session. Yeah. So um, we did the two EPs over the space of a couple of days. Um, we, we weren't sure how much we'd get. It was the first time in the studio. And it was a strange start to the band because although we got together, or we technically got together and started writing in 20, 2020, it was really 21 before we properly got into the studio because there was all those COVID restrictions kept coming and going and studios weren't open. So, by the time we actually got together, started rehearsing and booked some re- uh, recording time, it was probably October of 21. Um, and we weren't really sure how much we would get done, but we had 25 to 30 songs um, at that point. So we went in and recorded some live stuff and we got a lot more done than we thought we would. So we had enough for the two EPs in one session. So, yeah. um, See, when you're, uh, when you're writing songs as well, do you use... Like you're saying you had a lot of songs there. Do you pick, if you write 30 songs, do you pick the best 15? Do you have songs that you throw away? Or mm-hmm. do you just, if you're writing, if we're doing 15 songs for this album, we're writing 15 songs, or do you do more and then throw away the ones that are not working? We did We did throw quite a lot of stuff away at that point, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But, but we also, when we went in, because of the way we kind of structured it to get the two EPs done for that whole year, we also went in and done a lot of tracks that have never been released. Yeah, live and we tracks, done live a live video session as well, um, which was purely for YouTube. So there's a lot of tracks in there that have never been recorded, well, never been put onto the EPs or the album. And even like we're in the process of recording an album just now, and there's a track that was probably written for the last album for the last album yeah. that didn't make it on that album just purely because it wasn't ready. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, like you never throw anything away. You never know when it's going to come back and and, uh, right. and be better formed or whatever. That's also quite good as well, though, because for anyone that's following you, you know, when they go to see you live, yes, they'll have their favourite tunes and this and that, but they might be hearing something. If they have bought the EP or the album, that they still might be getting something. That could, yeah. Probably- the last yeah, couple of times we played, yeah. we played stuff that wasn't on any of the recordings, so... Yeah, um, yeah the, the, the other thing that happened though is I think we intended to use more of it than we did, but by the time we got around to recording the first album, we mm-hmm. we just had a lot of new songs, and yeah. and they were, they because we'd kind of written them in a shorter period of time, it's similar to the album we've just finished, 
is that we'd written them in a period of time that it was like it felt like we'd written a complete album. So we weren't really looking back for new songs. It was almost like, well, we've got what we need for the record, you know? So, um, but I mean, we might go back and revisit them. So there's a couple actually that I would really like to revisit, but maybe we'll get into that the next time. Yeah. It is good though, because what I like about the album, it's there's, there's dynamics in it. You've got some songs that are really chilled out. You've got other songs that are a bit more rocking. It was giving me um, Gary Moore vibes. Right. <laughs> Maybe without the guitar. Is that my looks? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe his, his, certainly not on the guitar skills. I'll, 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 I'll have to say, you know. Maybe not on the guitar skills department. But. It's good, but you, th- you expect the new album to be out this year around springtime, I think you'd say. With well, singles coming out on, we think, Martin the 5th of April. Mm-hmm. And then the album will be about five or six weeks after that. So, yeah, I'll be out okay. kind of late May, probably. Are you just planning maybe the second half of the year just gigging? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've already got probably at least six to eight festivals in the bag, plus another couple of supports, good supports, yep. that we can't release the info yet. But um, So it's shaping up to be a really busy yeah. year for us live. Which is fantastic. We've got a little mini tour uh, uh, in September. We'll be going down to London and a few other places. Um, but, and then we've got a bunch of festivals in October and then a load in November as well. So, yeah, yeah. But for anyone that's um, that's looking for the album or future gig dates, as long as they're following you on social media or your website, yeah. you get the information as you release it. Yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, just before we finish up, it's been quite serious. So I'm going to do some fun questions for you. <laughs> right. Right. So, again, I'll get an answer from, from each of you. So, let's imagine you had a time machine, right? Mm. For each of you, if you could go back and see just one gig, what gig would it be that you'd want to see? I, I would definitely say Elvis in Las Vegas. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Mm. I'd probably pick um, Prince um, uh, the night he recorded Purple Rain in Minneapolis when he recorded the whole thing live. I'd probably want to go to that gig. I think that. <laughs> um, I, I would have probably uh, loved to have caught the original lineup of The Who, Keith Moon yeah. and Ben Whistle. I would have loved to have seen that, line, that lineup live. What would you pick, Ian? You know what? There's loads of gigs. The, the, the two that come to mind, and they're completely opposite, would be Queen, maybe like live at Wembley, 86. Mm-hmm. But my favourite band's The Doors, and right. and see going way, way, way back, when, before, even before they were signed, there's, that, there's a famous story about them. I mean, the first album was pretty much recorded live because it was just they were playing it every night in the, in, mm-hmm. in the party where they were the house band and there was the night that they performed the end and it was the first time that Jim Morrison he turned up you know drunk or on drugs or that and and it was just one of those ones where it was the first time he'd done the, the speaking section and just something yeah. like that you know would have been really yeah. uh, just to sort of witness it but then you know Queen, it, Queen would have been just outstanding to see with Freddie yeah. Mercury yeah, I mean, Queen at Live Aid would have been amazing. Of course, yeah. we, we, we were we were of the age that we could have went and done that, but we were all lazy. I was fourteen. Was I was Live Aid eighty five. Eighty five. So I was fourteen. I remember watching it on TV. And it was right, right, right. Right. I, I mean, I think as much as that would be good. I mean, unless you were on the front row. I mean, right. Yeah. So, Probably wouldn't have seen anything, which makes me think I would have picked the other one because you've got yeah, enough. Yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> there's, yeah. there's so many legendary nights in music, though, isn't there? Like Graham oh, was right. talking about uh, Jacko earlier on, and there's like a famous night, and I can't remember where they're playing, but the night he just ripped the frets off his bass and went and played live for the first yeah. time. And, like I don't know how much the truth's in that story, but things yeah. like that would have, must have been amazing to witness, yeah. you know? And, yeah. Or like any of the Hendrix gigs, you know. Yeah, so here's, yeah. a, here's another question for for each of you. So, imagine you've got to be you get to go out for dinner and drinks. You've got to pick four musicians, artists, dead or alive. Who would you be going on a night out with for dinner and drinks? 
I'd pick Dead or Alive. I would never, I would never. That would be a terrible night, wouldn't it? You'd be spinning run on it. I would say, I don't know, it's tough. Isn't it? I mean, definitely I'd have Prince and Bowie in there. Mm. That would be the first two that spring to mind for me. Um, I mean, I guess it's kind of difficult not to go, wouldn't it be massively cool to hang about with Elvis? Like, you know what I mean? It's like one. Like yeah, the yeah. coolest guy that ever walked the earth, really. You want to hang about with Elvis for a little while, you know? Yeah. So that'd be pretty amazing. And I don't know, Hendrix, uh, any of the guys, you know, like sort yeah. of legendary guys like that, I think would be. So many uh, people that it would just be fascinating to s sit and talk to them. But all these guys back in the day, you imagine you turned up for dinner and you're what, sitting. Talk about everything with them, they'd be like, let's get a drink. <laughs> I know, well, I mean, you could pick, like, if you wanted a right good night, you could probably pick Lemmy or something. Well, <laughs> Lemmy and Keith Moon. Uh, uh, probably get Keith Jagwood. What about Dean Martin? That's quite a legend. Yeah, the rap pack kind of guy. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you think, you think Keith Moon and that, and then you think, I, I, I don't rock hard enough to party. No, yeah. Nah. You probably wouldn't, wouldn't allow me to sit at the table next to him. <laughs> I don't like, think they'd be sitting for long. Wait a minute. If, if we were going to be meeting these guys, it would need to be when we were running about 20 to 25. Ah, because that's when we were walking. <laughs> <up. laughs> you could have done it. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, here's a wee question as well then. <laughs> you've all got your instruments. Is there another instrument that you wish you could play? I'd love to play piano at a, real, at a proper level. I mean, I can sort of, uh, you know. Think of it. Yeah, but I'd love to play. I'd love to play at a decent level, but piano. I'd love to be able to go and just play um, really well, play and sing. Just, you know that kind of thing. I would. I would say any instrument. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm terrible at the guitar. I'm terrible at the keyboards. But um, you want to hear him playing three blind mice in the recorder? That's pretty damn good. That's pretty damn good. This is why I'm a singer. <laughs> I don't. I I, um, I did a bit of trumpet um, in my early <laughs> days, but <laughs> I don't know. Maybe saxophone or something like that. That would be quite cool. Yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. What else do you play? Ian? What do you play? Do you play guitar? What else do you play? I play guitar and sing. I used to have. I, I was. I used to have drums, but I was basically the the guitarist that thought he was a drummer. Oh, you're right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But probably similar to yourself, I would. I would love to be able to play uh, piano. See, like boogie woogie. Like, do yeah, yeah. that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. it's brilliant. We get people doing it, and it's outstanding. But I'm unfortunate. Have you seen the guy on YouTube that plays it? And he goes just goes into random pubs. Oh. He, he's on YouTube and he just walks into random pubs that have got a piano and he starts playing boogie on the piano. And the whole place go every time the place goes well. It's just amazing. Yeah. To watch. It's brilliant. I'm, I'm that one where I'm I'm glad that I learned to play the guitar when I was younger mm -hmm. because I don't know what it is about your adult mind, but. You, you get to. I've not got the patience to sit and learn something now, and it, and it yeah, takes yeah. a long, long time to, to learn properly learn an instrument. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm okay on the guitar, but uh, I've not got the patience to sit and learn something else as much as I would like to. Yeah. It's, the, it's the time factor as well, isn't it? Your life when you get older becomes so busy with everything else that revolves around your family and all that stuff. When you're younger, you sat in your room every night with nothing else to do. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. that's when you had the time to kind of learn these kind of things. Yeah. And then, what, what, kind of, what kind of music is it you play yourself in? So at the moment, uh, I'm playing in. I, I play a lot. I play pub gigs. So mm -hmm. I do that. That's purely just a way of making some extra cash. So it's all the, all the covers. So it's me and a right. guitar singing. Um, I play. I've got a rock band as well, and I've also got. I've been. The last couple of years focusing on this other band, and it's a, it's um, I, I don't really know what you, style you would call it. Maybe like folk rock kind of thing. Do, do you know a, a, an American band called White Buffalo? Yeah, mm -hmm. so, I've heard of them. I've heard of them. So, do you know? Do you remember that TV program Sons of Anarchy? Yeah, yes. yeah. Like the motorbike gang. Yes. A, a lot of their music was used for the TV program. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, so. And it, it's they, they're really stripped down. It's just acoustic guitar, um, guy on bass and drums. It's just three of them. Sometimes they'll maybe get a fourth member to do some uh, like a lead guitar. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of what I'm into at the moment. So that the last two years I've been playing and recording stuff that way. So 
I don't know, you might see me out on the gigging circuit with the, an actual band if I can be bothered actually putting one together, but yeah. the problem I've got is that, like everyone, I struggle for time. Yeah, yeah I know. It's uh, it's uh, it's one of these things, I think when you're, when you're in it, you're glad you're in it. Yeah. You know, because when you get a bit older, it's very easy to sort of like, well, you know, I'm too old now and, you know, it's it's a young man's game, but it, it really isn't. You know, I mean, you've just you just got to get out there and and, and do it because you enjoy it. And if anything comes of it, if you get some great gigs out of it, if you can record an album, yeah. great. But you know, doing it's the the fun part, and and hanging out with your your friends is probably the best part. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Um, yeah. I, mean I said to someone the other day, you know, you you write these songs, you record them, you, you might do a music video, or you know, you play live and it gets recorded. See if you do nothing else other than that, it's still brilliant to have. But yeah, yeah. Really, from my point of view, you know, I'll write so, write and record songs now. If someone picks it up and says, Listen, I'll give you a bunch of money to go and tour the world and that that's great. But I'm not expecting anything from it. But mm -hmm. it's just nice to have it. You've either if you're a musician, that's what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speak for yourself, but I'm looking for 40 nights in the sphere of this Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you don't get that, it's a big disappointment. I, I, heard, I heard you two have finished and we don't have another booking yet, so let's just put it out there that we're ready. <laughs> Very last question for you, and this is for each of you. Right. Who is your Mount Rushmore for bands and musicians? So who, who are the four bands or musicians that whether it be songwriting, whether it be performance, whether it just be the overall package, who are the four at the top of your list that you just put up there as being the greatest for yourself? God, man, I would definitely say that The Police is in there. Mm -hmm. um, and The Beatles. Um, I mean, for, for a four-piece of guys, the, a tremendous amount of work that they've brought out you just got to put the four of them up then, eh? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I've got another two to go, <laughs> that'll be about 16. Yeah, yeah, sir. Mount Rushmore's like a, like a football team. Oh, right, aye, 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 aye. It's a big mountain. <laughs> but, um, I was going to say, thank you very much, though, for uh, coming on. It is appreciated. I know everyone's busy. Um, but it's good that the question that they ask people, it doesn't matter how many people you ask, you get a different answer every time. It, it's mm. fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah other musicians hear what, what's going on in their mind and uh, I'll keep a wee eye on you on social media I'll try and get myself yeah. a yeah, I'm only through Falkirk way so it oh, doesn't, excellent, it, great. doesn't great take to, to come through but uh, you'll maybe see me in the audience waving at really? you <laughs> excellent. Be great to see. thank you for coming on and uh, we'll catch up and I'll keep a wee eye out for your album as well great. cheers thanks, 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 thanks very much mate. cheers bye. 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 thank you